So in paragraph six, uh, Dr. Young is saying that the ego develops because of collisions with the outer world and the inner. Okay, so we're born with a certain inner world. We're, as babies, we already have quite a lot in us, thanks to the DNA. And, um, and if you've ever seen a baby under two years old, you know they're like a little king or a queen because they expect all their needs to be taken care of and, and they have these gods that are taking care of them. <laughs> and, and, uh, but then what happens is that their godlike being um, collides with the needs of mom and dad. And so mom wants them to stop pooping in their diaper and so she comes up with ways to train them and that uh, is a collision with the outer world and or you want or you're a three-year-old and you know there's a candy jar or a cookie jar on the third shelf up there and if mom's not looking you can go up and get all the cookies you want there so, you go you know it's not always against someone it's it's in spite of someone <laughs> yeah i suppose that's true too but you're colliding with the outer world and and that's what develops the ego um, so ego is never more than more nor less uh, than consciousness as a whole so everything that's in your conscious mind is in your ego um, but that doesn't mean you don't know that there's something else that's driving you, that you have this dichotomy between the self and the ego. That's, that's the dualism that Dr. Edinger talked about, and uh, we're always on that sort of shuttle run back and forth between the self and the ego. Um, so this is why I come to these things, because I, we're forced to look at things in ways that I don't. I understand them in one way, and I'm suddenly having to understand them in another context. Mm -hmm. You know, because I understand, I understand what ego is. I understand what the syzygy is, the anima animus, and the shadow. I understand my relationship to those things, but when it comes to where, what does the ego know when you're interacting with another ego, for example? what are all of those parts how are they all functioning in there and I, I, I don't normally think in those terms so coming to these right. meetings makes me you know look at it a little differently which is one reason I come right well that's good to know <laughs> how about you John why do you come <laughs> well I, I think I think that's um, something that I hadn't thought about, but um, when you're dealing with another person, you definitely are dealing with a syzygy of its own composition, and they're and everyone is different. So you've got syzygy and syzygy. You're thinking, ego well, th ego. this is a thinking person I'm talking to. I mean, it becomes very obvious yeah. you know, because they ask you questions that you think are have obvious answers, okay. but they want to nail it down so you can say, "Aha, they've got a different." Okay, different so mix than I you're do. You're talking about me. <laughs> I'm asking you questions. <laughs> okay, so anyway, Dr. Edinger talked about this as being the ego self axis. And um, everything that's in consciousness um, is in the ego, but we're always trying to fish up things out of our unconscious that will help us with life and life gives us those things in the form of dreams and visions and we're stupid if we don't at least focus on those things because this is the two million year old man telling you something it thinks you don't know um, now the two million year old man doesn't have to live in the 21st century so it might tell you to do something that um, might be a little bit too big for your britches in the 21st century, but um, it usually dresses up the dream, and, and it usually dresses the dream up in something that's contemporary. So it, 
Yes, that's true. It doesn't. It doesn't. Okay. Um, so anyway, then Edinger's lecture on this uh, part one, he, he's saying that um, the book ion is built up in the same way as the psyche. So we first experience the ego, and that's chapter one. And um, no content can be made conscious unless it is represented to a subject. So this is the ego communicating with the self um, in order to make consciousness, actually. And, um, and he says that the ego rests on two bases, the somatic base and the psychic base. So the somatic base is uh, your physical ego, your body. And the psychic base is something that nobody can put their finger on yet. Okay, we can say, oh yeah, this part of the brain lights up, but you don't know anything about what's going on in that light. <laughs> you know? yeah. Right? Um, so, um, let's see. Um, and so he emphasizes that the ego is a profound mystery. Um, I am conscious, therefore I am. Uh, that's um, Rousseau's idea, I guess. Cogito ergo sum, I think, therefore I am. But the better translation is, I am conscious, therefore I am. Um, Rousseau. So the Cartesian discovery of the ego reoccurs in the childhood of every individual when the individual realizes there is authority in me, okay, I am something. And Dr. Jung described that happening to him when he was 11 years old in Memories, Dreams, Reflections, but um, I don't know, maybe I was precocious, but I sort of remember th things like that happening to me at like age four or five. I know it happened to me at four or five because I remember the incident and I remember we were in a temporary house it was right before I started school the next fall and it was it was uh, snow outside so it was winter so yeah. it was right around my fifth birthday which would have been December right okay and um, I think I'm, there's one interesting thing that I just can't avoid saying and uh, I'll apologize in advance, but um, one of the things in memories is, uh, in memories, dreams, reflections, is Dr. Jung's um, dream at age five of the quote-unquote man-eater, uh, which was obviously a 15-foot-tall phallus, okay? So that was his dream, but I had a dream like that, um, when I was five, or I had a vision like that when I was five, but my vision was of a vulva <laughs> and, a, and a very soft and succulent one. Um, <laughs> that was much more intellectual. Mine was a lot more abstract than that. <laughs> Have mine you gotten was, it out yet, Bill? <laughs> mine was like God opening the heavens, but yeah. <laughs> right. <laughs> Well, I, I mean, in my case, I mean, all, all these things come up at emotional times in life, right? And so in my case, I was, I had a little friend who was a girl, uh, so we were five years old, and for some reason, she and I were throwing mud balls or pies at one another, and it was all in good fun, but she went into her father's garage and his garage had like a Dutch door on it for some reason. And so I was winging these mud pies over the lower door into her garage and they were hitting her father's car. 
Okay. <laughs> <laughs> and, and so then I don't quite remember the transition, but I remember that I was in heap big trouble with Woke my father. <laughs> okay, so I was in heap big trouble with my father who wanted to take a nap. And my mother wanted to take a nap, but they had to whip up on me because of this mud pie incident. <laughs> which Mom was and dad time was interrupted, huh? Yeah, which was totally <laughs> animal. Okay, so somehow I ended up in bed with my mother and father, but my mother had come between my father and me, so I was sort of spooning with my mother, and my father was on the other side, and so they both, I guess, sort of went to sleep, and I'm lying there very. Uh, you know, sort of relaxing, sort of going to sleep, but then I had this vision of this very plump vulva, and um, and I remember the dream very distinctly. And so then, when I read Dr. Young's dream <laughs> about the veil, as I'm saying, uh, you know, what's wrong with this picture? Actually, you know, interesting question. Um, well, mine was an emotional time too. We had just moved from uh, into a new city. We were building a house. We were waiting for the house to be built, and we had to rent somewhere. And we had left behind a uh, a nurse, you know, a, a, a nanny we'd call it now. And she had been with us since I was at least two. So, and she was more like a mom than my mom, and we were, she would play around with us. And suddenly I didn't have that person, and suddenly I was uh, uh, all by myself in the front yard building a snowman, and it either went dark or it went light, but whatever it was, I suddenly was like I knew I was there all alone, and it was very scary, and I knew I was a, an I am that I am. I knew, I, you know, I knew that I, I was an individual right at that moment. Mm -hmm. Uh, hmm, interesting. John, do you remember That's more such abstract. Things, yeah? <laughs> before, we, before we lose the light of the restaurant. Uh, I don't remember, a, I don't remember a, a memory of a conscious, a waking of consciousness. I just remember um, very early experiences on our trip to New York when I was about five. And I remember the sun coming in. I was, we were on the Staten Island Ferry. I remember the sun coming in in the morning and blinding and Every, everybody and it was very golden and because of the wood seats and everything and that a kid stole my green felt jacket oh huh. or no he stole my he stole my statue of liberty uh-huh but i remember wearing my green felt jacket so i have an image of that but it was i wouldn't say that that was anything that was startling it was just a, yeah. a memory yeah, for me it was. I was suddenly like really self-conscious from that moment. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah. Okay, so we're thrown out of here again.